is review at episode 11, recorded January 13th, 2012. Hackers, Classroom Tech at CES, and e-textbooks. This episode of Review Ed is brought to you by Exactly College Prep Done Right. Increase your chances of getting into your dream college by 80% or more. Visit them at exactly.com and follow them on Twitter at exactly. Welcome everyone to Review Ed. We are recording on um, Friday um, the 13th <laughs> of January. And with me is my lovely co-host um, Christopher Dawson of ZDNet and the Vice President of Business Development at WizIQ. And of course, at Mr. Data HS on Twitter. Welcome, Chris. Good to be here. Thank you. So we have a show full um, or packed with uh, a lot of stories. Um, of course, we have uh, CES still this week. And um, but I would say let's start with our first topic: hacking the new literacy, or also 2012, the year um, of coding. Um, so we have uh, the sort of hype story of uh, New York City Mayor Bloomberg um, signing up for Code Academy and therefore taking. Or you could read it in the beginning, I think, uh, taking classes, whereas I think the reality was more like uh, he went on the side. Uh, Code Academy have a uh, process where they ask you for um, your email address and then uh, and then it's tweeted out, at least as right. I understand it. So right. um, let's say he educated himself what they do and maybe he will even take one of their classes. Why not? But uh, it's not that he started uh, to learn <laughs> code. But uh. <laughs> well, you know, he is. He is a, a. I mean, he built his entire fortune on business analytics and uh, a, a deep, deep understanding of the use of data, and uh, certainly ran his uh, mayoral campaign uh, with. Uh, uh, in some really pretty incredible software and and mm -hmm. uh, you know database uh, or databases um, and and the Bloomberg network of course is is the source for for business data so um, really it, it doesn't seem like uh, that much of a stretch for him to uh, you know maybe want to take things a, a step or two further but um, certainly as as he gets more involved in, in mm -hmm. education gets more involved in um, you know sort of the progressive look at uh, especially the New York City public schools and and how uh, they they should be, be coming together in the 21st century. Uh, it, it doesn't seem uh, out of whack at all. Would be great. Um, I am a little bit uh, concerned if it's more or less the same move. Like I feel a little bit about the um, Obama campaign, very um, sort of active. Uh, pre-election and then uh, even during the first year and even more so um, it sort of decreased decreased <laughs> now I think as we are um, coming towards um, uh, the, the new uh, elections of course uh, then uh, taking up speed again of course of course and <laughs> uh, it's the nature of the beast uh, but uh, you know I, I I do wish that we could see some some forward motion here, and mm -hmm. in uh, you know, in a real understanding and, and and desire to do something better with education, and 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 to move education into the 21st century. You know, the, the Congress Congress can't can't even reauthorize no child no child left behind. Not that they necessarily should, but uh, that's a a pretty critical piece of legislation and funding mm -hmm. in in the states that you know can't can't make its way through through our Congress. That is is utterly deadlocked and uh, will probably only remain even more deadlocked as we get into the elections, uh, which uh, are promising this year to be perhaps even uh, more partisan and bitter and nasty than, than usual. Um, so I, I'd love to think this is going to be an opportunity for politicians to uh, you know, have this flurry of activity that, that at mm -hmm. least gets some things accomplished. 
I must say I'm totally jaded, and I don't think it's going to happen. So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Hopefully we can uh, can reengage whatever president manages to to get in here, and and the other elected officials that are uh, are are gunning for 2012. Uh, but you know, that's politics. Yeah. Our little snippet of uh, politics at the beginning. So let's cover the news of the week for um, coding and education. So we have three stories. The first one, um, Treehouse, uh, basically putting out a game where two people um, log log in with their Facebook credentials and then um, they compete uh, against each other by uh, learning how to code according to the treehouse founder by typing it all uh, over and over again and then one uh, eventually wins which is of course um, just a nice way to uh, lead to treehouse's premium products so currently priced uh, between 25 to 49 um, dollars a month depending if you take it with uh, video uh, tutorials or just um, the pure coding part um, but I think it is somehow combining gaming uh, learning how to code and learning how to code seems to in uh, 2011 and probably even more so in uh, this year 2012 uh, be one one trend or sort of the new thing to do and uh, yeah no I, I I agree and and to some extent I, I and I think we've talked about this uh, before I, I wonder about the value in the mainstream. Uh, mm -hmm. For this, because uh, you know, how often do do any of us, even those of us who are, are pretty deeply mm -hmm. immersed in tech, actually end up doing much coding? You know, that's there's there's content management systems and there's you know all these great Web 2.0 tools that sort of isolate us from that. And there's plenty of folks who ultimately end up having to dig into the back end of these systems. But th for the majority of people, you know, Facebook doesn't require a lot of coding. Uh, so I, I I wonder, you know, where where the this sort of gamification of 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 coding and 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 the study of coding can somehow meet just power use of the web and the resources that are available and you know really uh, appropriate not just appropriate but but powerful uses uh, of of social media tools um, and and of, of various you know web two o tools I wonder where those things kind of come together and and I think this will probably shake out um, you know coding is not for everybody but it's not going to kill anyone to have a, a sense of what's behind uh, some of what we see and use every day. Yeah, for me it's also the question whether is uh, it is just a big hype, basically getting the stories from the Valley, San Francisco, the Bay Area. Um, usually people, um, even in education, pretty uh, forward always um, seeing where the, the newest thing is. But as you said, will this be um, for math? adoption or will it more or less uh, reduce as it is today um, on this relatively uh, little group of people interested in coding anyways maybe attract some more um, as I read about schools in the UK so they want to replace ICT by now more um, maybe serious uh, computer science lessons um, but yeah, it, it's probably uh, anyway always the case. Um, is it good to now go 100% on STEM or 100% on computer science and then um, do this for a couple of years? Years I remember last week we uh, touched on this topic uh, somewhat and then in some years saying, ah, we need literature or um, something else. But However, we have um, two more stories um, about hacker apprenticeships. So basically, uh, you can apply with basic skills and also uh, when you're a more experienced coder, you are put in a sort of a boot camp and um, make you even more professional with the uh, premise to then um, find a placement in uh, a company. And the uh, last story, so the recruiter works uh, pretty much the same, uh, whereas they only um, focus on like very experienced coders and uh, want to 
form them uh, or train them to uh, become the best of the best um, for then making uh, a very nice referral fee uh, of apparently up to 20k by um, placing these people in one of the big companies in the Bay Area uh, supposedly but I think it shows that it's very much a Bay Area thing and the Bay Area has its own dynamics and I think for some people yes this will be the right thing but for the masses I think and no ecosystem I think in the United States but also worldwide is comparable to this uh, tiny area around San Francisco so I think this is really one of a kind story probably yeah no I, I agree with you the only thing that I think that that is, is perhaps uh, you know has, has broader implications is the idea that if we look at at the general preparedness of, of just the US population mm -hmm. to to jump into high-tech industries it's mm -hmm. it's remarkably low and you know Bill Gates for for years has railed against immigration restrictions uh, because yeah. there's simply not enough talent here in the states and uh, well, that that's a problem so uh, perhaps if we can at least sort of expand uh, you know people's uh, uh, interest. You know, peek mm -hmm. a, a few bits of interest, and then also really do some some good things to uh, make the connections needed to to find uh, domestic talent or, or find um, even just North American talent uh, to, to feed into some of these companies uh, without them having to do international recruiting. Uh, you know, that then maybe there will be uh, some some additional value folks that, that might not otherwise um, you know might might be very skilled uh, but may not otherwise have the right connections uh, mm -hmm. to get into the, the Microsoft and the Adobe's of, of the world uh, so uh, definitely I, I agree this is going to be Bay Area centric but uh, maybe some ripple effects elsewhere mm -hmm. yeah I think you touched on uh, some very important points one on the one hand uh, startup visa um, still sort of in the discussion on the other hand yeah I mean great times for uh, developers certainly um, we we probably talk about a level uh, developers but uh, yeah what uh, the salaries and the other perks they get um, and how the big uh, tech companies and startups rival um, for them uh, it must be wild times at the moment so it's that even um, the the B and and not to be disqualifying but uh, not not everybody is a genius in coding so when you are a solid like B level um, coder there there seems to be an important shortage um, of people at the moment yeah Definitely, definitely, and and you know it it, uh, it, it it's not just the rock stars, uh, as you said, who are, are getting the jobs. There's there's a, a huge need, uh, and and which is why we offshore so so much of the development uh, that happens. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either. But uh, you need people who can, at the very least, sort of walk this line between uh, tech and design, or or design yeah. and code, and and people who have a solid understanding, but may not be you know hack into the night sorts of folks, but who can speak the language and and who can. Uh, Kind of translate design or user requirements into uh, you know s functional specifications, even if those specs get uh, fleshed out in, in uh, India or, or the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's a lot of value to that, and it still helps position the United States as uh, as, as sort of a, a leader in an information economy, which is always an important thing. Let's move on to our next big block, the, uh, I think, interesting to uh, many of our viewers, so classroom technology, and of course, we have the big uh, consumer electronics show um, this week in Las Vegas, I think, finishing tonight. And um, there were quite some announcements related uh, to education or also um, some products directly uh, made for an educational use and I think whereas uh, CES for the rest is um, often a lot around prototypes but uh, what I have seen um, te education related or education technology related the products seem to be pretty solid and uh, not only prototype versions so which probably explains as classroom technology or even laptops for students are usually not the far or high end of the market 
but you have to calculate with other things like price point and um, just that they are a solid um, solution probably. So let's start with two Marvel stories, so not the, the comic uh, book uh, or comic company. Um, Marvel, they are in the one laptop per child um, which uh, or who introduced their first actual laptop product at CES. Um, an 8-inch screen exists in two different versions, one solar-powered and one sort of has the other rubber um, close closing thing. And <laughs> um, so also, uh, and of course, Android-based or Linux-supported, and um, the other thing is the uh, collaboration of Marvel with Stanford University. And they uh, invented or came up with the so-called uh, Smile Plug uh, device, which is a little device that creates a micro-cloud. Um, uh, sort of the, the, the teacher has, um, the teacher directs or controls, yeah, I think controls is the, the right word to say. So controls this micro cloud for um, his or her classroom. And um, basically then, of course, the idea behind is to make every classroom uh, moving from a traditional setting into an interactive setting. So what do you think about these uh, first two stories? So the one that actually excites me the most, and, and people who who know me won't won't be surprised that it's not OLPC. Um, <laughs> but the one that excites me the most is actually the 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 Marvel um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, plug-in plug PC. I, I had one of the first uh, Tonito plugs and and reviewed that uh, a couple of years ago uh, on ZDNet and was fascinated by the idea of it because. Pretty much you plug it in, you run through a, a simple web-based wizard, and all of a sudden you have a, a platform for sharing stuff. And it's really quite easy to, to boot it into Ubuntu you can, um, mm -hmm. or, or something that's a little more familiar and comfortable for folks. Uh, but you know, all of a sudden it has, uh, you know, right from a simple web interface through a built-in web server, uh, you have a, a handy little server. And you can do all the things you can do on a server with it. Um, and this this uh, the, this Marvel plug uh, uses a lot of the same underlying technologies, just uh, evolved. Um, it, it's uh, uh, the the potential applications for being able to just plug something in that you don't have to worry about, no moving parts, you know, all mm -hmm. SSD or, or uh, you know, flash based, uh, and then to have teachers have their own sort of space, not having to worry about you know a, a full Moodle deployment or or anything that's uh, uh, you know, something that requires a lot of sort of back-end administration, but allowing teachers to, to share and work online in a, a, a new and interesting way with their students in a way that is uh, sort of very uh, safe and, and uh, non-threatening. It's just mm -hmm. it's a little plug. Uh, but it, uh, it, I think there's a lot of potential there. Of course, there's something to be said as well for a larger uh, school cloud-based um, uh, de deployment of, of, a, of a larger set of systems or platforms. But um, you know, I think there's there's a lot to be said for something that is uh, also a bit more personal. I think it's mm -hmm. also the sort of thing that if a school uh, wants to be testing a variety of platforms, this can mm -hmm. plug just as easily into you know a system administrator's uh, 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 you know desk or, or or a server room and, and make that a, a a place to test. It's also a great thing for students to have a sandbox, and it's cheap enough that uh, you know the students can can actually work and use a, a server, their own server platform in a, a computing related class, uh, and not have it affect anything else, but be able to essentially have a mini cloud available. So I, I get excited about this one. I think, uh, um, yeah, I think the one laptop per child um, first laptop is sort of um, the point probably um, nicely executed is that you can also charge it with, uh, as they say, non-traditional uh, power um, cycles or uh, circuits. So that should be, uh, or it's apparently pretty robust and, um, and solid. We have more sort of hardware news from Lenovo, so uh, a Brainia Classmate uh, PC. 
Um, so Intel based and they on the one hand came out with a new clamshell laptop. Uh, always reminds me of the first uh, Apple um, laptops of course. So sort of, I don't know, maybe uh, once again they all focus that um, it needs to be robust when um, a nine or a ten year old uses it and um, doesn't break and they cannot break um, I don't know um, away parts um, and so on so that's that's probably the the right way to go they also have um, classmate PC which is uh, sort of a convertible laptop so that looked pretty interesting I think the price point there then is uh, we are starting at uh, 499 um, which is of course not very very cheap so um, depends how many parents or how many schools and so on I think as I said it's pretty interesting to see it also seems to work fine how it folds and um, turns and so on but uh, I don't know if this will be or has the potential to be the solution for um, the the average classroom, for example. What do you think? Well, yeah, I spoke with the folks at Intel about this, mm -hmm. and I followed Classmate PC for for quite a while. And they're uh, you know one of their other announcements. I don't know, I don't remember what the exact number is, but they've reached a kind of a critical mass of deployments uh, uh -huh. worldwide of the Classmate PCs, and and uh, you know they're they're they're. They, they, they've released a lot of these guys. So this latest generation, though, is, is kind of an evolution of that. And and as much as you know, the the, the netbook thing was great for a while, and then we've kind of moved away from the netbook model. There remains a, a real need for something that is a, a robust computing device yeah. uh, that a, a nine-year-old, whether they're in a classroom in the states or in a, a, a very rural classroom in very harsh conditions in a, in a developing country, um, you know that. There, there's a need for this, and and so Intel has always sort of differentiated their clamshell and their convertible uh, devices. The clamshell being much more centered towards either younger students or for developing markets where conditions are going to be a little harsher, uh, versus the convertibles where you want to address the needs of of a, of a tablet but still provide students the ability to create content easily. And we've had that conversation before as well. That you know neither of us is is very adept at typing on an iPad, but uh, give us a decent keyboard and we're okay. Um, I think the other thing that, that is compelling here, and Lenovo announced, I think it's over a year ago, that they were going to be sort of advancing, um, you know, the economies of scale of, of beginning to deploy this. But um, you're right, the price point is not low uh, in a time of, of ever-dropping prices, um, but it's also competitive with the iPad, and mm -hmm. it comes with uh, one heck of a software stack. Um, that's, and that's true, yeah. That you was, know, there, there's uh, a lot going on uh -huh. there. That was good to see. The, the specs are okay, and uh, as you said, um, the, the software is sort of really um, the, uh, the interesting thing um, to, to not have additional cost for um, either buying yeah, software or applications uh, on top of that. I think so too. Right, right. So, um, well, <laughs> we had the last keynote of uh, Microsoft at CES. And sort of in this uh, more of a one hour, uh, Steve Barmer talked. Um, I think the exciting part for everyone, um, if there was an exciting part, but uh, let's say it was, was of course coming at the end. And I watched um, Mary Jo Foley's um, commentary on uh, the Twit Network Live, so I sort of had an impression of uh, what she thought um, like already during the, the keynote but it's good that you put um, the article on ZDNet uh, she wrote on uh, in our doc so basically um, we had uh, Kinect so Microsoft Kinect for Xbox uh, before and now they came out with um, Kinect for Windows and well, the academic price of uh, one hundred and forty nine dollars compared with the normal price of two forty nine is definitely more than the um, sort of usual fifty dollars Apple drop off uh, a product. And I actually um, think for education, 
I was I was sort of thinking of, uh, thinking of the health and the sanitary point of because I mean I may be a little bit special about this, but I usually don't like to share my touch screens with anybody else. So, and as long as it's in the family, it's okay, but I have to say I clean it a lot. So, <laughs> but just as a side note. So, for me, in an everyday use, but of course also in an educational use, having gesture control and as still today, we have those um, projectors sometimes in the classrooms, but as soon as somebody stands there, you have the shadow and everything. And having a class and the teacher, of course, uh, directing and interacting, acting um, by gestures, if the Kinect like, works in a natural or maybe let's say almost natural setting um, I would imagine it's a little bit challenging as everybody makes a certain move a little bit different so but having this as a command uh, device and and therefore doing a classroom activity I think it's it it has potential maybe the first generation as so often is a little bit early to to say this will be found in uh, the majority of classrooms in I don't know one or two years but I can definitely see the sense in it and I mean enough schools are equipped with windows still so um, why not I think this is pretty pretty exciting I, I think so too, and and I think that obviously there needs to be an ecosystem to go with this. There needs to be the the right software. I yeah. mean, if you look at at uh, you know Smart, for example, they have a, a huge content ecosystem that, uh, regardless of the, the limitations of a projector based system, uh, mm -hmm. you know it, you want to use a smart board because there's a lot of things you can do and lead your class through. So you need to have that that software ecosystem. But that being said, you know the the first year I, I started teaching. I've never been so sick in my entire life. Uh, the, the schools are just big petri dishes, and mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with you one hundred percent. And I was teaching high school, not even uh, you know elementary, where it's yeah. even just nastier. But uh, uh, you know, uh, Dell and I reviewed a, a Dell and an Epson uh, interactive projector that used a wand-based system as well, and that at the very least allows you to stand back very naturally from the projector and from the screen, mm -hmm. and and still be sort of in amongst the class, but able to do a lot of control and, and, and markups and, and whatever else on the screen. And I think we can take, you know, it, the potential is there for this to go way beyond that, but I think that that provides a bit of a preview of just the easier, more natural functionality that you mm -hmm. can have, uh, or, or even just being able to have uh, sort of almost touch gestures from a distance. Uh, you know, I think there's, the, uh, you're right, there's a lot of potential here. We've got a few years or a couple of years at least to see uh, where yeah. this gets fleshed out, but uh, definitely portends things to come and maybe is a, a reason for, you know, there's not a whole lot of excitement around Windows 8. Uh, maybe this will be a reason for schools to get a little more excited about it. Um, one thing they demoed, but due to the price point, probably nothing um, to come into schools or even into many uh, of our, like, let's say, normal budgeted households uh, quickly was the um, eye control. So basically giving commands um, by, yeah, just following the movement of, um, of your eyes. And uh, they said that it could be used with um, simultaneously up to 10 people. So um, that would be pretty cool as well, but that's, of course, way beyond um, classroom budgets and, um, well. Special also, education settings, though. You know, there's there are certainly some possibilities there where kids have uh, you know limited mobility or or have uh, you know fine motor issues. Um, the ability to to put that into a, a resource room and and have students uh, be able to to make use of a computer much more naturally uh, mm -hmm. that that is going to be pretty impressive. It's also uh, as applications in, in autism interventions um, where you can track eye movements and be able to to kind of prompt and force a more appropriate social interactions, eye contact, that sort of thing. So again, idea, needs, yeah. needs an ecosystem, but uh, the, the idea of using it for response intervention or for uh, you know really being able to, to push forward some things with, with students who, who otherwise, uh, you know, these assistive technologies are of limited utility. Um, 
there there's there's some cool applications and and the money tends to be there to to address that in a resource room or a yeah, you know, that, separate environment. Mm-hmm. That would be uh, of course very very necessary to have uh, the um, sufficient financial resources to right. have this in a in a special needs setting. But uh, that would of course be be very nice and uh, it worked surprisingly well. So um, I think over the past years um, they really made some good progress with uh, this particular technology. Definitely. So then we sort of leave CES um, a little bit and come to the Hewlett Foundation. They sponsor um, uh, prizes or uh, sort of give an award uh, of $100,000 to improve automated scoring of student essays. And when you read the article, they generally want to foster critical thinking, um, keyword deeper learning here, and uh, problem solving uh, in general. But what do you think of uh, a program being able to really um, mark uh, and evaluate student essays. I was a little I, bit surprised. I, I, I mean, that's, that, this is a, a lot of technology behind this, and, and uh, you know, I think that it, it, one, points to where we've come in terms of, of our ability to to really code some some pretty impressive AI into what will, I think, you know, a few years become more mainstream applications. We've already seen with Turnitin, for example, their ability to, to scan and, and very rapidly process information in, in essays and things get, you know, the, the, and even admissions applications uh, at the higher education level. Uh, but this is uh, really critical, I think, to being able to turn an essay into more of a formative assessment mm-hmm. or something that can provide immediate feedback. Uh, if you assign an essay uh, or, or a report or research or, or whatever, um, the ability to, to grade it quickly and provide immediate feedback to students, it's not there. And, you know, by the time students get feedback from those reports they wrote over, you know, the holiday vacation, uh, they've, they've, it's long gone out of their heads. And it's hard enough to engage students to write a reasonable research report or essay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so something that can speed that, at the very least, provide, you know, some immediate feedback uh, and then allow the teachers to take, you know, a deeper look, you know, themselves later on. Uh, this is... You know, it's a potential game changer in, in, in terms of assessment because look at the, you know how much of uh, what we do in assessment tends to be multiple choice or, or fill in the mm-hmm. blank or yeah. you know, something that is easily automated and that's a you know it's a poor substitute for a critical analysis of a subject. Yeah, I hope that they will uh, really see it as sort of the first idea of the quality, the structure of a written essay that you then still have the teacher as the sort of ultimate uh, person who gives the mark and um, who then also has a deeper look into, um, I think, stylistically and um, not only content-wise how it's written, but... uh, yeah, not only what is written, but also how it's written. And so exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. So, yeah, the, uh, I think this would be one of those other technologies that teachers tend to uh, tend to worry about a little mm-hmm. bit as, as, a, as a job displacer, but what it really is is something that can improve the way Probably they do their Probably enhancer, tasks. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly. I mean, this, this isn't going to replace a teacher by any means. It just takes the load off sort of this, this initial push to, to get feedback to students and allows them to, to actually take the same deeper dive they're asking their students to take. So... Uh, I'm, uh, this was a, a, I'm thrilled you put this up on the up on our uh, agenda because this is a very interesting stuff. Very, very much so. Um, interesting stuff for us is our first sponsor. So let's take um, just a short break and thank them. Our sponsor for this week is Exceptly, and they help students and families with the um, college preparation process. So basically, depending on when you start uh, preparing in, to get into the college of your dreams or your target college, if you will, um, for example, uh, you start preparing two months prior to actually um, uh, sending your application, uh, exactly gives you um, recommendations and also targets to write on. And um, basically, 
what they want to do is to really prepare the students and to take the guesswork out of the college application process. And uh, of course, we want to thank them for their support of Review Ed. And you can find them at uh, www.exceptly.com and also at Exceptly on Twitter. So maybe uh, you want to tweet them and thank them for their support of Review Ed. This week. Definitely, and, and check out the product too. I, I just before we got it online here, I was uh, going going through it and having a kid who is applying to college right now, uh -huh. and uh, and who's almost as disorganized as I am, uh, which is uh, the bar is very high there in terms of disorganization. Uh, you know, he's kind of wrapping up the process now, but boy, do I wish uh, <laughs> you know, I had been able to, to use this because uh, it's a, it's actually a very interesting uh, piece of, a piece of work and a very different approach to uh, moving someone through the process. Yeah, so maybe um, something you could even um, try out, uh, and I mean you have um, several more kids to come to oh, yeah. um, to that point. Uh, so yeah, would be would be interesting. Maybe um, you you simply try it out and give us some feedback on how the tasks actually work and uh, if it helped him uh, in the I process. Absolutely will. I will. So then um, our next article is uh, not so pleasant for virtual charter schools, so basically charter schools as being part of the uh, public school system in the States, of course, and uh, having those on the Internet. I, um, even myself, not being too much in... Um, involved in uh, the public education debate, but it is, of course, uh, one of the very important um, discussions going on and uh, I myself read uh, a few articles already with some criticism of um, not having enough uh, monitoring and seeing how those um, charter schools in general and then also virtual charter schools actually uh, perform. And um, yeah, uh, the article states that only 27% of them meet uh, state standards. And Chris, you are in the States, but uh, tell us a little bit more about this discussion going on. And so uh, you're right. I mean, there is this sort of ongoing conversation about charter schools in general, and there's a lot of people who believe that uh, charter schools are, are really critical to educational reform mm -hmm. because they're given a lot more latitude than the yeah. average public school. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, with that latitude, there has to be a degree of accountability and, and some measurable results. And I'm not saying that we have a great system for measuring those results here in the States. I think that a lot of these kind of standardized summative assessments that we do are, are very poor indicators mm -hmm. of the educational quality uh, in, in a particular institution or, or what a student gets out of an education. And uh, they tend to really favor the the, uh, the broad and shallow approach uh, to education that, that we oh. all too often take, as opposed mm -hmm. to the deep dives that an awful lot of charter schools and, and, and private schools, for that matter, um, are, are, are favoring because most of us realize that that's where we need to head and when you can sort of free the schools from those constraints, those curricular constraints mm -hmm. and allow them to pursue what we believe are, are really best practices um, but then you keep the old assessments in place, then it's, it's the, the, the cards are stacked against them, and, and I think the same is happening with these virtual charter schools. Again, um, I've seen some virtual charter schools that are truly, truly outstanding uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the way that they allow students to interact, the way that they allow students who may not otherwise be well suited to the public schools, whether that's um, you know students who might otherwise be homeschooled because mm -hmm. of, of certain convictions, uh, or, or certainly students who uh, you know have various disabilities that make attending a public school a, a real challenge, uh, or simply students who would like to pursue other opportunities. You know, one of my kids is a, a big theater geek, and he's nine, and, and you know, he's, I, I could definitely see in a couple of years uh, the need for him to be really flexible in, mm -hmm. his, in his ability to go to school. All of a sudden, a, a school that is largely asynchronous and online starts making a lot of sense for him, and I don't have to worry about the socialization piece because he's, he's getting that through, through dance and theater and whatever exactly. else. Yeah. So this starts just as charters are supposed to do. It does give parents choice, and yet, uh, you know, if our measurement tools are, are imperfect, and I, and I use that term generously, uh, then, then how can we really say 
Ugh. You know what these charter mm-hmm. schools aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I, I I do believe that it's it's all too easy. You know, we look in higher ed. How often do uh, online courses get offered where there's a bunch of PDFs that are tossed up? The students contribute to a, a blog or a forum. Uh, maybe they'll have a, a virtual office hour once, and okay, you've just completed a course, and students aren't going to get very much out of that. There needs to be synchronous components, and there, and there need to be uh, you know frequent check-ins and and, and the, all the formative and summative assessments, but. Uh, you know, I think there's also a, a real uh, movement uh, to, to take that to the next level, and I think there's some some great things being done. So um, we 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 need to work on those measurement tools, and that's uh, that's what this really comes down to. I think part of it is also that um, the charter school movement, unlike. Um, other schools in the public school system uh, don't have the constraints of money as money them being sort of uh, maybe one of the possible solutions to um, make the education public education system more cost effective slimmer and so on so there was a lot of money was put in or is still being put into charter schools, may it be virtual or um, brick and mortar. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think this causes also um, a lot of people being um, uncomfortable with it and then um, trying to find something. And uh, I'm not saying that this is not justified. Um, and of course, they they need to sort of meet the same standards like uh, every other school in a, in the states or in the country, but um, sort of uh, I see that there's probably also some some bias bias and uh, difficult feelings towards this whole thing as. Um, I think other public schools simply uh, fear that um, everything should become a more cost-effective charter school and that it's only about c- cutting cost, basically. Right. No, I, I, I agree. There's uh, certainly a, a, a bias against uh, charter schools in many ways, and, and uh, you know, charter schools don't often have the same um, requirements for collective bargaining, so you mm-hmm. have uh, teachers' unions who, who have uh, you know really significant concerns about mm-hmm. the way they operate, and then you take that the next step to a virtual school and uh, you know we've got teachers who are being paid on either a merit system or on the same pay scales as teachers who have to uh, you know go into a brick and mortar building every day and deal with 30 screaming students in their class yeah, sure. uh, you know it, mm-hmm. it's understandable that uh, yeah. uh, there'd be some resistance to the movement so uh, we'll see how this shakes out I think we're, we're really early in in having effective charter schools and you know even the study notes that a lot of the schools uh, you know that were included in the looks, uh, you know, there wasn't enough data to do a, a meaningful assessment. But, um, but we've got a, a, a couple of years, I think, before we see how this shakes out. But it, 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 not to say, you know, the standards still need to be in place and still need to be adhered to, and, and we just need to figure out how that's, how that's happening. So, Talking about good or uh, perhaps even excellent teachers, um, an interesting article in the New York Times of the impact uh, and an early uh, elementary school, um, really good teacher, teacher you really liked, um, has of an impact on students' later lives um, by 1.25% uh, less likely to have a teenage pregnancy, the same uh, 1.25% um, uh, less, le- uh, more, li- sorry, more likely to go to college, and then also have some sort of um, higher salary um, in their working life. So right. apparently, quite some impact. Yeah, and you know, I mean, we've we've known for some time actually that uh, you know a, a teacher, an ineffective teacher for for one year, uh, puts a, a student behind, and an ineffective teacher, if you happen to hit. For that, uh, for two years, um, the chances of being able to catch up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, by by the end of high school, uh, actually becomes quite low, and and we see major effects on on literacy, on um, and and and, you know, I, I would love to believe that that you know all teachers can be good teachers, but there are uh, a lot of teachers who simply don't have uh, the necessary background 
or, mm-hmm. or training or, or depth of understanding uh, to do what needs to be done. And, and I think that's a, a failure of our teacher education system and a failure of the fact that, you know, what, what are you going to uh, do for a job that pays a whole heck of a lot less uh, than, than something in the private sector? Um, it's it's hard to attract the best and the brightest to teaching, and uh, and and I've seen countless people who are smart and 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 really dedicated and devoted have to walk away from teaching because they can't afford to teach. Mm. Uh, you know, I was lucky while I was teaching to be writing for for ZDNet, and uh, that that extra income was the only thing that allowed me <laughs> to stay in public education. And um, you know, particularly for a new teacher, uh, it, it's it's a rough few years until you can move your way up the salary ranks. So. Mm. Um, um, I've got to say that the, the the importance of having a good teacher every single year mm. uh, it, it can't be understated. And, and these numbers, some of these numbers seem seem small. You know, 1.25 percent less likely to get pregnant as a teenager. Uh, well, 1.25 percent. What does that mean in, in the real world? Um, but if you if you look at it in the in the aggregate, and you look at the cumulative effects of of ineffective teaching practices kind of year after year, uh, then then I think those numbers are, are going to to increase pretty drastically. Yeah, that's that's really sad that basically people cannot uh, afford to teach, whereas here in Europe, uh, even when you work um, at an elementary school, but then, uh, well, the, obviously the, the higher you, you, you teach, so um, if you teach uh, A-levels or um, college, of course, you earn, you earn more. But uh, even the elementary school teachers are well paid and uh, also with a lot of social security and um, I would say it is still one of the more popular jobs um, for some people unfortunately not really because they want to teach but uh, they want to have um, a lot of holidays and not having such a hard life sometimes although it's that's maybe hard to say when you have to teach a class of 30, 80 year olds. Um, I don't want to say that, it, that this is not hard or that you are tired at the end of the day. But um, it really seems to be very different from the system. And uh, not that teachers are highly valued as individuals here in our society. I think of course, they are accepted as uh, being um, trained people, people who, who studied, um, and so on. But the teaching profession in general over here is, yeah, sort of a direction a lot of people definitely want to take. And um, they, they get decent money for it. Um, whereas I know some friends from the States, um, for them it was, yeah, very attractive to change from um, normal public education system in the states and then teach in a private uh, or not, not a private but teaching in an international school then uh, in Switzerland and I know that the next um, sort of destination will be in another international school um, somewhere around the world but basically not Doing after this, uh, or going back after this um, time in Switzerland, back into the normal public uh, education system or a public school um, in the United States again. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's I think just a, a an unfortunate byproduct of, of kind of the, the way things have, have moved forward over the years. But mm-hmm. um, you know, I think it's also hard to uh, you know for for teachers when they look at the at the pay scales and the and the salary schedules when that PE teacher who's been teaching gym for uh, thirty years is going to be making three times what they will be starting out out of college teaching, you uh-huh. know, physics, uh, AP physics, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, and working, yeah. you know, extra hours and hours over the summer and, and whatever else. It, it's tough. And, and I think the public perception as well is, well, you get paid pretty decent money for uh, having all summer off, mm-hmm. when in fact teachers either are working over the summer to make extra money or, or are taking classes to, to be able to advance themselves. It's, it's a tough sell. And... Um, you know, so the the more the, the the public can understand the need for really high quality gifted teachers, uh, hopefully the more accepting uh, they'll be of of a move towards uh, more more reasonable salaries and and benefits. Our next few stories are around the e textbook news. So um, our speculation from uh, last week um, got an answer pretty quickly. Uh, so this week. 
Apple sent out the invitations for their January 19th event, and yes, so we now know that uh, it'll be around um, education, that's for sure. So I think uh, it's pretty um, safe to say that there must be something around, to, that it must have something to do with textbooks. And um, so, but apparently uh, both uh, Osman Rashid uh, from No and Mac McInnes of uh, Inkling, they don't seem to worry too much about um, this announcement, should they? I, I, well, I mean, uh, it's, it's obviously really speculative, and, and um, Still, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to me that, that Apple's going to move forward with a textbook platform, but you know, Apple has also had student information systems before, and um, you know, Pearson purchased uh, you know PowerSchool from from Apple mm -hmm. a while back and entered into you know one of the biggest, uh, you know, the, in fact, the largest market share in the country. So um, there's lots more that could happen, perhaps on a on a more uh, interesting educational level on mm -hmm. an iPad, for example, or, or you know, across an, an ecosystem of Apple products um, mm -hmm. than just textbooks. So I'm actually wondering if, if we may not see something, you know, a little more, you know, that, that's either a little less textbook-centric uh, and, and something that's a little more revolutionary. I hope we will. Looking forward to <laughs> that. So, yeah. Finger fingers are crossed. Um, but, but also, you know, is this... Uh, Something that's going to be open and and uh, such that uh, Inkling and and No uh, can take their products and 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 move it into this ecosystem and in fact perhaps get you know right on the coattails of, of Apple's potential success here. If it's a, a more open kind of ecosystem oriented thing, in fact, No and and Inkling could be real beneficiaries of it if Apple products become again the de facto educational products in in K twelve. So uh, I'll, I'll, I I actually am, am waiting with bated breath for for this particular particular announcement. Ha, Chris, you are you're hoping for a lot there. Um, uh, I am. <laughs> Apple and openness. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, fair enough, fair enough. But oh, open it in, in, in some principle, perhaps, as opposed to in practice. But uh, inclusive, maybe, is, is the better word than, than open. Yeah, sure. Um, that's, that's right. And so my next speculation is when you sign up for the New York Times now, you get the Nook for free. Uh, Nook Color otherwise is uh, priced at $99 then maybe why not buying textbooks, enough textbooks, and get an iPad for free? I, you know, I think that there's a lot of models for this, and and uh, you know we're already seeing the you know subsidized cost for for iPhones. I, I, uh, Apple's been more than happy to uh, subsidize the the cost for their phones uh, with carriers. Uh, wouldn't it make sense if they were to subsidize the cost of their uh, of their iPads or or even Macs with uh, you know uh, things coming from textbook providers? Absolutely, I think there's. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a model to which they are necessarily averse. Even though they tend to be pretty firm in their pricing, it's not as if you can go get a deal on an app somewhere. Uh, they aren't uh, closed to the idea of of uh, subsidies coming from content providers. So um, certainly, the same thing is is obviously happening with the Kindle Fire uh, and and the other Kindles uh, and and the Nooks now are, are basically uh, you know commodities uh, that are uh, really designed to sell content. Uh, the the textbook market is a multi multi billion dollar industry so it would certainly makes sense that if you can keep pushing forward uh, the sale of that content on modern devices uh, you know I think that uh, makes a lot of sense for publishers especially mm -hmm. given this article that you shared from the Chronicle of higher education uh, you know e textbooks save many students only a dollar and and I've absolutely seen that with my my own uh, son uh, buying his college textbooks of course he wants to buy them uh, online and, and buy ebooks e whenever possible uh, you know, why not? And be able to annotate and cut and paste and, and mm -hmm. interact differently. Uh, but really, there's you know we we we've eliminated a, a huge distribution issue. We've eliminated a major carbon footprint. We've eliminated uh, materials and supplies, and yet the cost is still basically the same. Uh, so uh, you know where, where's the where's the value aside from you know the ability to cut and paste something uh, mm -hmm. for students? Uh, 
you know. Absolutely. I asked Osman Rashid, so I had the chance to um, do an interview with him for EduQuest a few months ago or a few weeks ago. And, um, and basically, yes, uh, I mean, the textbooks are just uh, 20% on average cheaper than um, a physical book. And then, as the article states, rightfully so, you cannot resell it. And then also the challenges in the classroom, uh, apparently that the wireless connection um, has not always been capable um, when mm, several students at the same time, of course, wanted to access their e-textbooks and, and wanted to connect with the publisher websites um, as well. So I also think um, e-textbooks as nice as it is to have the 3D graphics, cut and paste, um, individualized uh, parts in, in general, um, for both students and also um, teachers, um, which leads to our next story. But um, I think they, they have to become significantly cheaper. And, um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's you know it's 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 happening elsewhere. Uh, but uh, you know, even if you, uh, you know, my my son got himself a, a nook. I think I mentioned that uh, you know for mm -hmm. uh, for Christmas. Um, and uh, you know he said, well, geez, Dad, it's still the same cost to buy a book. You know, I was only saving a couple bucks over a over a hardcover mm -hmm. that's on sale at, at, at the physical Barnes and Noble store. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously you're paying for the intellectual property there, but uh, you know you've still eliminated so much of of the the, the distribution and overhead. Uh, those those savings need to get passed on to consumers, uh, and, and 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 as well as to to educational consumers. It's it's, it's only a matter of time if you'd like to see the sort of adoption that that needs to happen. The uh, disruptive potential would be uh, x times higher, of course. So yeah. Last story about uh, e-textbooks, um, Academic Pub, uh, they add uh, 22 new partners um, for custom textbook platform, uh, basically allowing teachers, professors um, to individualize their textbooks and um, create, basically create it. Um, a good idea, uh, in your opinion, from both business side as well as uh, having such an academic platform, basically, for publishing? Absolutely. I mean, Pearson has been pushing this model for, for a mm -hmm. while, and, and uh, um, it, their, their goal is, is you know, they can create e-books, but it's, it's still to actually do custom publishing of, of dead tree books. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's one thing I've given them props for before on this show, but I think mm -hmm. that um, actually the idea, if you, if you talk to how many professors are, are not bothering to give uh, to assign a book to their students? And this is post recession 2012 now, and uh, you, it's very difficult to justify having a student spend two hundred dollars on a textbook when they're going to use yeah. four chapters out of it. Uh, you know, to to be able to to make use of a high quality, vetted, peer reviewed, uh, you know, educational resources, things that are are you know coming from major publishers, uh, but but not have to have all the the extra. I think you'll actually find. Uh, that, that, that sales in general are, are going to be able to increase. Perhaps the margins will decrease a bit, or you won't see, you know, every textbook won't be $200, but if a textbook's only 25 mm -hmm. uh, and it only includes a portion of the content, well, but I'm able to sell it to 50,000 more students who might have otherwise just used online resources or, or handouts from a professor, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a great business model there and, and a, a lot of benefit really to, to the students and, as well. Last block, uh, in other news, uh, Piazza lost one Z by raising another $6 million. So now they are Piazza.com with two Z instead of three Z. <laughs> and, um, well, they raised uh, their new A round um, of $6 million, uh, as I said, which um, comes to uh, a total of their funding for with uh, 7.5 million now and they race pretty quickly so um, I talked with the, the founder so Pooja uh, at that time she was still Pooja Nath so uh, apparently um, in her personal life there have been uh, some changes as well and well 
jokes aside, so I don't want to reduce this to um, getting more money and being able to buy the Piazza name and, uh, and dropping the third Z out of the name. Um, I think this whole um, sector of what Piazza do is uh, basically being a forum with Q&A for college students. Um, so extending the classroom uh, experience once again, that students can ask uh, other students um, from their courses, uh, college course, uh, about something and uh, get answers. Um, I mean, Piazza are, of course, by far not the only player, and even though they um, signed up some pretty um, nice names, uh, some of the best colleges uh, in the States, uh, but essentially, if I read the article correctly, it's not an entire college per se that signs up. As um, colleges make it or leave it up to the in individual teachers or professors uh, what system they want to use. So if I am um, signed up for several college courses, uh, to say drastically, uh, three different professors could basically use three different systems. And um, so in my opinion of or my opinion on it is that we have to see if one of these players um, will become dominant over the others, or I think a couple of them position themselves sort of, sort of being the an appetizer for Pearson maybe to, to be acquired. Um, as Pearson, we all know, is constantly looking for new lucrative acquisitions. But I think in Piazza's case, and I mean this, this woman um, entrepreneur, has a pretty interesting story. So coming from India to, I believe, then um, studying at Stanford and working some time at Facebook and now becoming the founder of her own startup, I would say, um, on the one hand, take the money that is currently available and on the table, so everybody would be stupid, um, harder times will come again and not take the money. I think the funding is pretty high, but it is also an investment in her as the person, I believe, and probably I, I, rightfully so. No, I, I agree, and I, I do think that there's... Um, yeah, the, the the real return most likely on this investment is, is going to be a buyout. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th this is a, a very reasonable thing to include in a larger platform, whether it's an LMS or, you know, a, a textbook business. You, yeah. you, you, you buy a textbook from X company, probably Pearson, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you have access to this platform to study along in class. I think that makes a lot of sense. Honestly, though, I, I continue to struggle with the idea of additional platforms for for interacting and collaborating when all of your students are just on Facebook anyway. So give me a Piazza app on Facebook uh, that, that brings all these things together and, mm -hmm. and hooks into your uh, your LMS and, and things automatically talk together and there's a, a really nice use of your seven and a half million dollars and charge a you know a, a moderate premium or charge schools to, to open up access. Um, you know, I, I see that as, as a more reasonable model. I mean Facebook may be you know not here two years from now, but there's going to be some social platform, um, and probably Facebook. I think uh, it'll so, probably be Facebook. <laughs> probably will be, but uh, regardless, uh, uh, regardless of, of my personal feelings on on Facebook uh, as a platform, you know there's there's going to be some social tool that is mm -hmm. the ubiquitous tool for for students and 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 should be for the professors at the schools that are teaching those students, and uh, you know then then I think that. You know, it's not just one more service to get into, but uh, but I'll yeah. be curious to see where the, where this goes as a con as a concept for bringing students together. I like it a lot, but there's other places to bring students together too. Yeah, um, I would say the space to be in is pretty safe. It is not an exciting idea, but on the other hand, so sort of the plus is that both uh, investors as uh, also big companies in education buying uh, immediately get the idea and don't have any problems with it. So uh, definitely qualifies not only Piazza, but uh, the other services as well, definitely qualify um, for a buyout. Out. Um, I agree with your other point. For me, I don't want to have the hassle and um, uh, have an account for three, four, five different services, but uh, may it be Facebook or another, simply um, 
take my login and uh, then have my account or accessibility for all of the other services. Federated well. and call it good. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, tell us more about um, WizIQ's new public beta and the updated virtual classroom as uh, I am basically not qualified to um, explain it in such a nice way you can sure, um, guide sure. our viewers through. Yeah, that you know, I think this is a. Uh, we're excited about this, um, you know, and and I think it's uh, we we've we've been we had this on the table for a while, and it's been coming close. And we've had it in private beta, um, but we're now to a point where we've been able to release it to the majority of our customers, and uh, essentially this brings uh, a lot of new things to the table. The most important of which, from our perspective, is that the need for headphones can go away. So we're using Flash's latest active noise cancellation, um, and uh, you know that means that all of a sudden. You know, if you're in a regular brick and mortar classroom uh, and you want to have a lot of students interacting with a guest speaker who is making use of a whiteboard uh, but is doing it virtually, uh, then now all of a sudden your students can do that. It was not something that was practical before, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so it. it Increases the applications in both brick and mortar and in in you know more virtual settings where uh, invariably people have issues with audio and video setup. It's just one of those things that the people struggle with. So that's that's a big deal for us. Uh, then we've added uh, six-way video. So we had four-way nice. video, um, but uh, now it's it's six-way, um, and that video is leveraging. Um, uh, uh, peer-to-peer uh, -peer technologies in a, in a much more robust way as well. So if you are on the same network, uh, chances are you're going to be able to connect uh, a lot faster and at lower bandwidth with, with folks. Um, we think we've uh, improved uh, overall the, the user interface. So uh, in particular with the, the video uh, functions, there's now more of a Skype-style kind of conference room mm -hmm. uh, view that you can take. So again, mm -hmm. it's lending itself to uh, study groups or to something where you want to be able to see people face-to-face -face and focus more on the audio video visual component instead of the, the whiteboard component, um, all of which, uh, you know, the other features are all still there, but those are those are the big, big deals, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, we're going to see some, you know, some, some, some more good things evolving out of that, and, and more use cases, more, uh, um, more ability to take it as, as a, as a, Larger learning platform, as opposed to just a strict, uh, you know, virtual classroom distance education tool. So we're we're excited. Oh, uh, from what I've read, from what I've heard, uh, I'm excited as well, and I am definitely willing to um, give it a try and see uh, in comparison uh, how it uh, has evolved now from the previous version. And um, well, we have to see for um, this format here if we can integrate it. But uh, I can definitely see for me um, the use case of giving uh, from time to time a webinar. Um, May it be for teachers or, um, well, I have also my um, little philanthropic uh, German project. So giving a class uh, from time to time there using WizIQ and the virtual classroom technology. Um, I mean, I sort of saw WizIQ's evolution and know all of the different virtual classroom um, classrooms. And um, so therefore, I know that they uh, made some progress with it, so I'm definitely excited and curious to see what the newest version is uh, now capable of doing. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it should be good stuff, and I, I think that uh, you hit on a, a key as well, the evolution of, of sort of just the overall functionality yeah. and um, you know, our ability to deal with uh, varying bandwidth and, and uh, you know, the, the vagaries of, of, of you know, people's setups around the world accessing a virtual classroom. Um, definitely some improvements there, too. So I'd be looking forward to your feedback as, as well uh, on that. I'll, I'll hit acceptly, and you hit was IQ, and we can, uh, we oh, can exchange yeah, notes. Ab absolutely, exchange notes. So our last story for today, IBM uh, talking about social business skills and the uh, importance of social media. Um, isn't that shocking of a company like IBM? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, I actually talked with the folks at San Jose State yesterday, uh, day before yesterday. Uh, uh, they're the ones kind of leading this uh, effort and, and the sort of initial people mm -hmm. who are on board uh, with uh, with IBM. And uh, what IBM is really providing here is a social sandbox. So they can be offering classes and coursework on uh, not just, you know, how to use Facebook, but but really how to, how to run an entire social media campaign.
campaign, how to uh, change the way that a, a work group functions by leveraging social tools. Um, how do we take what's already there and use it in a, a really business appropriate sort of way? So um, we have lots and lots of millennials who are making their way through college and hitting the business sector uh, and bringing all of their millennial social sensibilities with them, mm -hmm. um, but yet so few have sort of this uh, you know, guided kind of, of training and a, and a way to uh, make use of these tools uh, in, a, in a smart way. Uh, it's, it's one thing to share with your friends the, the latest parties from last week and the pics of, of you and your dog or whatever. It's another to build a brand and identity and a marketing campaign through blogs and social media and social networks and, 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 and. Um, and that's what this curriculum is focusing on. And they're expanding that now to uh, be working with a number of schools and the professor I, I spoke with there he's in their their business department um, mm -hmm. it's a, a management information systems and uh, and, and their uh, uh, organizational management uh, departments are working together actually he's incredibly passionate very excited uh, it's it's a neat platform so I'll be be curious to see how this kind of works its way into business and computer science curricula uh, going forward um, but definitely an acknowledgement that uh, you know we, we are no longer in 1999 it's it's a very different place and from my own experience I can definitely say that there's a need uh, for that uh, to learn how to uh, make a marketing outreach or social media campaign as uh, basically maybe not every day but uh, regularly I get um, emails of uh, community managers or uh, otherwise uh, marketing social uh, outreach so usually people um, in their early to mid 20s and every time I get those standardized uh, messages um, about what my site would be doing and if I didn't want to add a link to their um, company website and so on uh, so basically showing me that they sent probably out to every single blogger in somewhat education or online education the same message without once having visited either my Twitter profile or the Facebook page or maybe even have a, had a look on, on the website. Um, so usually people you would imagine they grew up with social, being social, social technologies, technology in general and making things um, people in their 40s uh, are sometimes uh, much more, more sensible sensitive, yeah, sensitive yes. about yeah yeah yeah, no, I, I yeah. agree, and it's it's something that they just sort of take for granted and use it in whatever way, and, and they leave behind uh, the, the the physical social pieces, mm -hmm. you know, not, not social from a tech perspective, but social from a, an actual human interaction perspective. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very timely and a, and a very interesting platform as well. Yeah, uh, it sounds uh, to, to me, I can definitely see it, and... Um uh, also, uh, the parents and the teacher, as you put it, who currently shy away uh, from uh, using social media in an open way as, um, well, I mean, in uh, 2010 and 11, we always had this discussion of uh, we have to protect the kids, so therefore put them in a controlled environment, whereas um, now having this movement, uh, which I think Myself, I think it is much more natural. Of course, it needs to be done uh, age uh, appropriately. But um, being sort of more in an open um, environment, as, as you said, both in the real world um, and then also uh, online and uh, showing how to use this in a meaningful way then uh, instead of being in your closed little uh, environment and... Um, eventually then not being be, being really prepared for what will be required from you in the future okay. uh, yes we were so close but no ah. worries <laughs> no worries i think we both made our point and um, yeah. yeah i think i mean really it was our last story for today yeah, so, so it only so. leaves it up to me to to thank you again for um, a wonderful episode for your work. Um, 
in the dark uh, providing me with some uh, other stories and um, yeah it's really a joy uh, having you as a co-host of Review Ed. I, I, it's, it's a blast I, I really appreciate the opportunity thank you very much once again, everybody who wants to check out uh, Christopher's Twitter, that's uh, Mr. Data HS or Data HS. <laughs> and um, otherwise, he has, of course, uh, the education blog on ZDNet. Uh, other ways to find you, other interesting pieces you have uh, recently written, Chris? Yeah, so uh, well, definitely. Just uh, I, I've got my uh, New Year's uh, resolution still up, and still uh, taking some thoughts on, on that. I'm writing a lot more for the WizIQ blog too. So that's uh, uh, WizIQ.com/blog, and uh, we've got some interesting conversations happening there around open content and and. Oh, uh, you and, took uh, some heat from the Moodle community. We yeah. we did, and it was it was a total oversight. It was my screw up, and and uh, but you know it it led to some very interesting conversations, which. Which was good, and um, so we, we certainly welcome that. But uh, uh, so yeah, some interesting stuff going on there too. So don't hesitate to uh, to check wanna, out the other. You want to hear place. my point uh, or my opinion on that story? Well, but I'm always very very direct. So I read um, this uh, person's blog post, relatively lengthy blog post, and uh, I was asking myself, so. As she talks a lot about being social and um, w basically makes a point of um, telling people how to be social, so I was uh, asking myself, well, why didn't she then in the first place simply write an email to WizIQ um, saying the problem that your Moodle guide um, has the same name or the same title like uh, the Moodle guide she uh, had written before and basically uh, either ask you uh, to change it directly in the first email or uh, waiting for the answer from the WizIQ site instead of uh, I don't know moaning a little bit and then um, uh, well, she, she writes a lot about the, the power of the crowd and the community and that this is what uh, basically made WizIQ change, where I think you were simply not aware that the titles, the names were the same. And right. as soon as you learned that, uh, you, you changed it. So a simple social media outreach uh, would have been enough, but... Mm, of course, it would have prevented her from writing this uh, lengthy blog post about the whole story. So right. it wouldn't have been a, an as nice story. And um, seeing it, I think also what some people fear in education as soon as a company comes in. Um, I mean, we have this Creative Commons, violation of the Creative Commons license and so on. So what they, what some people in education, by far not everybody, but uh, some people get a little bit sensitive as soon as a company is involved. Yeah, so basically, <laughs> long story short, I think it would have been um, the most natural in the age of social media that uh, she might have wanted to reach out and then most certainly got a reaction and this whole thing wouldn't have made such high waves um, like like now. But uh, well, yeah. she, I'll, I'll she, say, I think she got a post. On this. Yeah, she got a <laughs> she got a post, and you learned some things, and uh, yeah. So therefore, it's, now let's have a conversation around it. So you know, it's it's, it's okay. We we all make mistakes. I think you're right, though. There are some. There's you see, you know, there's since when a company, a for-profit company, comes in and starts mm -hmm. trying to to make some things happen in the space, and, and it always looks as though there's not any sort of philanthropic uh, or actual community yeah. engagement. It's just contrived, and and I understand that bias. I, I really do. So anyway, thank you. It has come to a good end for um, for both parts, and um, personally, I think the new name uh, is in any way worse, uh, probably even a little bit better than the old name. Um, so that's good, and let's finish with 
with that little anecdote and um, thanks again so much for um, joining me this week and I'm already looking forward to next week. As am I. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon.